All right, if you will, before we get into our text in John today, let's look at a couple of other passages. Let's go to Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21. We're going to consider some parallels in the synoptics and then one passage, our passage in John, which differs differs somewhat. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to Him in the temple, and He healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that He did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were indignant. And they said to Him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. And leaving them, He went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. And then in Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11, verse 15. Mark eleven fifteen, And they came to Jerusalem, and He, that is Jesus, entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And He would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And He was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy Him. For they feared Him, because all the crowd was astonished at His teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And then Luke 19, so Matthew and Mark have a parallel account, and Luke has a parallel with Matthew and Mark. All the synoptics record this purging of the temple by Jesus. Luke 19, verse 45. Luke 19, 45. And he, again, talking about Jesus, entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. This cleansing of the temple, which the synoptic gospels speak of, happened toward the end of, of Jesus' ministry. Let's turn over now to John, just a few pages from Luke 19, to John 2. Jesus also cleansed the temple at the beginning of His ministry in a similar way. There are some differences you'll notice as we consider our text in John 2. Differences from the account given in the synoptics because it is a different event. There are similarities But this one that John tells of, this cleansing of the temple happened prior to the second and later cleansing which the synoptics speak of. John chapter 2, verse 12, After this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. 
The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's pray before we begin. Our Father and our God, we are grateful for your revealing your Son to us in the pages of Holy Scripture. We are grateful for... uh, the preservation of your word. We do ask, Lord, that you would uh, help us in our understanding to uh, know more of Christ, to love him more, to follow after his example. We pray that you would grant to us a zeal for the purity of what happens in your house, for the worship of God. We pray that you would drive out of us, Lord, whatever it is that impedes your worship. We pray that you would make us pure, holy people. We pray that You would help us now as we turn to your word once more, that your Holy Spirit would um, bless our time together, that we would uh, grow in in our understanding of your word, that you would uh, build us up and, and shape us after the image of Christ, in whose name we pray that he might be glorified. Amen. So two weeks ago, we saw the first miracle of Jesus, and in our previous text, the wedding at Cana, it was done in a small town before a small crowd. And his disciples saw that sign and they believed on him. And another sign we're going to see Jesus do in the text today is the cleansing of the temple. And we get to the end of chapter uh, 2 there and we see that many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing, including this one. In our narrative today, Jesus is no longer in a small town. He's in the capital city of of Israel, Jerusalem. And at this time, it would be a, a happening place. This is the time of the Passover feast, the premier feast of Israel's ceremonial law. And this time, Jesus will manifest His glory, His authority over all things to a much larger crowd than He did, to a public crowd, not a a small town wedding, but front and center on the, on the largest stage in Israel, the temple in Jerusalem during Passover time. So we pick up our narrative in verse 12, which tells us, After this, he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Jesus before had been in Cana of Galilee, and so he's now leaving the hill country where Cana was and heads toward Capernaum, a city located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee in the region of Naphtali. Later in his ministry, in Jesus' public ministry, Capernaum would serve as a sort of headquarters for Jesus. If we turn over to Matthew 4, Matthew chapter 4, Capernaum would be given much of the light of Christ in his ministry, and because of that they were accountable. Matthew chapter 4 in verse 12, Now when he, Jesus, heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them light had dawned. The northern tribes of Israel had been in darkness under Assyrian infiltration 
ever since the Assyrians carried off the ten northern tribes into captivity 700 years prior. But, but now the first miracle of Jesus was done in Cana, which as best we can tell is in the region of Zebulun, and Jesus will establish his ministry headquarters in Capernaum, which is in the region of Naphtali. So yes, on them the light had dawned and they had seen a great light, who John calls the true light. And to whom much is given, much would be, much is required. And even though Capernaum was given much light in the ministry of Jesus, her punishment would be severe for rejecting the true light. Later in Matthew's gospel, we read in Matthew 11, verse 23, Jesus is giving these woes to cities that did not accept his ministry, accept the gospel. He says in verse 23 of Matthew 11, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So we learn from this that the exposure that you have to the ministry of the gospel does directly affect the judgment you will receive from God if you resist the gospel ministry, if you resist the teaching of the Word of God, if you resist the Holy Spirit, if you will not bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, there will be much more to suffer for you. So Jesus goes down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, and they remain there a few days. His mother and his brothers, John, uh, is going to make multiple refer reference to the, the siblings of Jesus, his biological family. Mary did not remain a perpetual virgin, uh, contrary to Catholic belief, but had other sons and daughters after her firstborn son, Jesus Christ. Two of them would, in fact, be inspired of the Holy Spirit to write New Testament epistles, those being James that we looked at uh, last year together, and then Jude also was another brother of Jesus. So Jesus, with his family and his disciples, abode in Capernaum only a few days because the Passover feast was at hand, and there was going to be an 80-mile trek to Jerusalem south of Capernaum. So they've got quite a, a journey before them. So they head toward the city of Jerusalem because Jesus must fulfill all righteousness. He will keep the law of God. He will keep the annual feast of the Jews. And so they head toward Jerusalem. That's verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And it was always said that one went up to Jerusalem, wherever you came from, Jerusalem being situated on a plateau of the Judean mountains. Mount Moriah was where the temple was built. You have the Mount of Olives on the eastern side of the city. So you always went up to that plateau where Jerusalem was. And then the Passover feast, of course, was the biggest day on the Jewish calendar. This was the premier feast. They would sing the Hallel Psalms. They would eat the bitter herbs to remind them of their bitter slavery in Egypt. They would eat the unleavened bread at the Passover feast to remind them of the haste with which the Lord had brought them out of Egypt. And they would roast the lamb, the lamb whose blood they would uh, spread on the doorposts and the door frame. So the death angel would pass over. They would eat that lamb that had roasted they'd roasted and whose blood had been on their doorposts. And so John, here in his gospel, begins the countdown of the final three symbolic Passovers. He makes reference to another one in John 6, verse 4, and then reference to a third in John 12, verse 1. Jesus, we understand from this and other sources that he had approximately three years of public ministry because the Passover was an annual feast. So John begins this countdown of the final three symbolic Passovers before the Lamb of God is slain and Jehovah does not put to death those who are covered in His blood, passes over their sins, forgives their sins, 
when Jesus atones for their sins. And every Sunday on the day of the resurrection of the Lamb of God, we celebrate the new covenant Passover, that our sins have been forgiven, that God has punished Jesus in our stead, that our sins have been cleansed, they've been put away with expiation, propitiation, Jesus has atoned for them. We keep this celebration every Sunday. No better use of the day, I can assure you of that. The Scriptures assure you of that. No better use of the day. And there's no celebration in the world like the celebration of the saints every Sunday. If we think of the Passover, wow, that was a big deal. Every Sunday is a bigger deal for the New Covenant saints than the Passover was for the Jews. So we celebrate the, work of our, the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ on a weekly basis. And so Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, and in verse 14, "...in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there." Interesting scene. Uh, we have these animals here. If you go to a movie theater or a sporting event today which I rarely ever do. That may be an annual thing for me, but you will almost certainly get hungry sitting for a few hours watching whatever it is you paid to come watch. Almost certainly the case. As if ticket prices weren't already high enough, the venue charges an exorbitant amount uh, for whatever food or drink they're selling, and conveniently for them, they forbid you from bringing your own in. Uh, so if you ask Rebecca, I always gorge myself in the parking lot for any of these things and then go in and I'm good and then I come out and you know, don't waste any money. But uh, the only thing I use there is the bathroom. But uh, similar marketing gimmicks were going on in the first century too. Nobody was forcing anyone to buy these animals that were necessary for the sacrifices in the temple. But that's why they were there. It was a convenience that was provided for the Israelites. If, if for those Jews who would be traveling from further tribes, it would be convenient for them to leave their animals, not have to deal with them on a, a long trip. They could just buy whatever they needed right there on site. You might pay more for it, almost certainly would, but that's the price of convenience sometimes, right? Uh, you buy things online, like tickets and whatever, and they have convenience fee built in. So that there's be fees for the convenience of, of getting the animals that you would need for these sacrifices on site. You wouldn't have to be bothered with bringing your own. But as we're going to see, not everyone who attempts to make things easier for you actually does you a service. And so Jesus finds that these oxen, sheep, and pigeons are being offered there. And of course, there's money changers uh, sitting in the temple as well. The money changers were there because the half shekel was the temple tax, according to Exodus 30, verse 13. And that had to be paid in Hebrew coinage. And so these money changers could swap foreign currencies or maybe currencies that had less valuable metal content, and they could collect a commission for this service. Some say, it, most say it was you know, around 10%. So there was some money to be made on the, uh, the religion of Israel. And so Jesus finds this, this situation. It's almost like this marketplace is what it sounds like. And yet this is going on inside the temple grounds, the courtyard of the temple, what was called the court of the Gentiles. And so these animals are there. And the animals in Israel... They were an important, important part of their worship. The sacrificial system was given to the children of Israel to remind them of the seriousness of their sin, that sin leads to death. Something has to die for your sin to be cleansed and atoned for. And it reminded them of the holiness of God who will not look on sin with favor, who does not tolerate sin, who doesn't just brush it off as if it's nothing. And it reminds them of the privilege that it is to draw near to God. The high cost of coming before His presence. That's what all of, the, all of these things is what it reminded them of. What should have reminded them of. And so as Jesus comes down to the temple, we may ask, what, what should Jesus have expected to find there? And obviously, He knows all things. 
But what should someone expect to find there in the temple? How about creatures worshiping their creator? Men worshiping the God that made them. Penitent souls being reconciled to God. That should be found in the temple. Maybe the law of God being read and heard. That should be found in the temple. The word of God, give, give attendance to reading. That's a new covenant exhortation as well. What about prayers with the sacrifices being offered up unto God? And yet, what does Jesus find? Jesus finds that the sacred heart of divine religion had been hijacked by the greedy, by opportunists who saw, a ch- who saw an opportunity for them to make some money by making religion easier on others. And so, he finds men who don't care whether other men are cleansed of their sins before God. They see an opportunity to make money. So they're going to infiltrate the temple to make their money. They see a sacrificial system instituted with many different animals needed. So they set up shop in the temple courtyard so the people can buy whatever animals they need right there on the spot. Charge whatever they like. And so Jesus does something about this. Verse 15, And making a whip of cords, He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. This is an interesting picture of Jesus we have before us. Uh, In the arts, which I don't appreciate any art of Jesus, it's all beyond worthless, but in the arts, He's most frequently depicted as usually a helpless baby in a manger, maybe a sympathetic humanitarian meeting some need somewhere, or he's the, you know, the stricken, smitten, and afflicted Jesus dying on a cross. Well, all of those should not be hanging on your walls, but one you won't find hanging on anybody's wall is the whip-making Jesus. I've never seen this Jesus represented in the arts anywhere. Probably certainly not in Judaism, but any, nowhere else have I seen the whip-making Jesus featured in any kind of art. Jesus epitomized gentleness and kindness. Yes, no one was ever and no one ever will be as gentle or kind as Jesus Christ. But neither has anybody ever been or ever will be filled with more holy zeal than Jesus. The very zeal that led Him to fashion this whip and drive the cattle and sheep out of the temple and the people that sold them. And with all of the oxen being sold, there were likely ropes and cords lying on the ground that had been tossed to the side, many commentators make reference to. And Jesus would have gone about gathering them up, fashioning this whip. He drove them all out. The oxen actually belonged there, but only to be sacrificed. Not to be merchandise to be profited off of. The people that Jesus drove out actually belonged there too. They needed to be reconciled with God. But they weren't there to be reconciled with God. They were there to make a quick buck. And so they had no place in the house of God. The people that Jesus drove out should have been there to worship. That is the express purpose of the temple. Not to make money on enterprise, but so that men might draw near to God and be cleansed and have their sins forgiven. They were there because they loved money more than God. Passover to them meant a celebration of profit and not peace with God. And so Jesus pours out their coins, useless metallic discs, he flips over their tables. And we might think, well, this, boy, this is some scene of chaos. I'll, yes, definitely a chaotic scene. And we might think, well, that was kind of you know, insensitive. Wouldn't their coins all get mixed up? How are you going to know whose is whose? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares whose coins are whose? Um, that's not the problem, is that their coins are getting mixed up. The problem is that they've mixed up the worship of God with financial gain. That's the problem. And Jesus isn't having any of it. And so he overturns their tables because the worship of God is at stake. Men's eternal souls are at stake, and yet they're too hung up on making a little pocket change that they're blinded to it. 
Jesus did not fear man. He feared God. And so he's not worried what men say about him and his righteous zeal of driving these animals out and flipping these tables over. He's, he, Jesus fears God and he would not tolerate, and we ought not tolerate either, that which offends God, no matter how offended men get. John MacArthur has said, we're so worried about offending men, but we lose sight of the fact that God is offended at their lives every day. So sometimes we need to make them offended and remind them of their great sin before God and call them to repentance. And so Jesus drives them away, overturns the tables, and in verse 16 he has something to say. And, he, and what is it? He told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. He doesn't release the birds into the wild. He tells them, take them away. Get them out of here. This is not their place. This is not their place. Jesus does not forbid them from selling. He simply tells them to take them away because that, the proper place for that is not here. It's not now. There's a marketplace if you want to go buy and sell livestock. But not here in the temple. This is holy ground. And we don't bring love of money onto holy ground. So, Jesus forbids them from selling on temple premises. Because God's worship does not exist so that man can get material gain. There are plenty in our day that believe that it does. And are, and are all too happy to make a quick buck off of... Um, gullible, professing Christians. The only trading and gaining that goes on in this place on Sunday is when we trade our sin for the righteousness of Jesus Christ and we gain an eternity in glory with Him. That's the only trading and gain that goes on here. Yes, there are churches hold bake sales, they hold yard sales, book sales. Uh, my own wife and mother teach piano and art inside these four walls. Some of you may not have even known that. And that's because it doesn't take place during times of worship. Because it, it's, it's not about the church not being used to provide goods to anybody. It's that it doesn't impede the worship of God. Because this place exists primarily, and you exist primarily, for the worship of God, not for money. Money will perish. It's useless. It's paper and metal. But your soul will live on forever either worshiping God or being damned by God for your failure to worship Him. And so, Jesus drives them away. And on what authority does He do this? He says, do not make my Father's house a house of trade. He calls God my Father. Later on in the Gospel of John, if we uh, get there, Lord willing, John 5.18 John notes that by Jesus calling God my Father, the Jews took this to mean that He was making Himself equal with God. Well, the Jews got it right. He was equal with God precisely. And so He has all authority to drive out what doesn't belong in His Father's house. Jesus is the object of worship in this house. And He says these animals are having this sale going on here is not helping. Get it out of here. Shut it down. And so, he has every right and all authority to say what is and is not allowed in God's house. And so he drives them away. And nobody stops him. Nobody stops him. He had the authority. They may not have liked it. I'm sure they did it. But he has the authority to do it. Every authority, every right and all authority to do it. And his disciples... Even though Jesus didn't speak to them, they're processing what's going on too. In verse 17, His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. You know, the disciples, a lot of times, they catch flack for being slow to comprehend what Jesus is teaching them. And Jesus explains things to them, and they still don't get it, and their questions are recorded in Scripture, and we're thinking, how do you miss this? They didn't miss this. Disciples, their hermeneutics were right on point here. And Brother David read the psalm for us previously, Psalm 69, verse 9. If you caught it there, zeal for your house will consume me. That's, that's where it was written. The very songbook of Israel that the disciples would have been all too familiar with. Psalm 69, 
verse 9. Jesus said, the scriptures testify of me. The book is about him. Not about your life, not about your needs, not about your goals and pursuits and treasures in heaven. The, goal, the book is about Jesus Christ. And it's given that you might know him and love him and obey him and serve him and worship him all the days of your life. And so the disciples remember and they apply it to Jesus. Zeal for your house will consume me. What is zeal? I love the word zeal. Uh, the Hebrew word in Psalm 69.9 is kinach, and it means passion, ardor, envy, jealousy, according to Holiday's lexicon, Pastor Carl and mine favorite. Webster's 18.28 defines the English term this way. I like Webster had to say. He said, in general, zeal is an eagerness of desire to accomplish or obtain some object and it may be manifested in either favor of any person or thing or in opposition to it and in a good or bad cause. So we can be zealous for good things, for bad things. Jesus here, being full of righteous zeal, he was opposed to making the house of God a house of trade instead of a house of worship, which is what it was intended to be. And Jesus was zealous, we would say, for the purity of the temple, that it not be defiled by man's greed, by man's, uh, man's lust for money. Twelve-year-old Jesus before had gone to the temple to excuse me, hear and speak of the glory of God with the teachers who were there. Thirty-year-old Jesus returns to find the temple in a state of Ichabod. The glories departed. The last time we read of Jesus being in the temple, when he was 12, he said he must be about his father's business. And the next time we read about him being in the temple, he is about his father's business. He's driving man's business out. Driving man's business out of the temple. Has no place here. Zeal for your house will consume me. So let's... Make some uh, summary applications here. Positively, you who claim to be followers of Christ, would those around you make the application to you that Jesus' disciples made concerning Him? Would they say that zeal for the, the house of God has consumed that individual? David was able to make the claim originally in Psalm 69.9. Could you stand with David and claim that? That zeal for the purity of the worship of God in his house has consumed you. Are you zealous for the purity of the worship of God? Our bodies are the new covenant temple. Do we come in here bringing baggage, bringing grudges, burdens from the weak that are distracting us, that are an impediment to our worshiping God, that serve as a distraction to the worship of God? Of God. When we're here, do we do things that keep us from the worship of God? Are we too busy playing, standing around sipping coffee and talking? You know, we are here to worship God and we ought to minimize and keep distractions out, keep out what does not help us worship God for the sake of our own souls and for the sake of our brothers and sisters. Keep those things out. Then there's also a, a negative application too, I think, here. So positively, we want to strive for purity of worship. Be zealous for the house of God. That that zeal for pure worship would consume us. But then negatively also, some warnings. A, a sex trafficker is someone who takes what is not theirs the, the body of another person and they exploit it to make themselves rich. Someone else's body, we might say, becomes their business. Beware of those who take what is not theirs, the body of Christ, and exploit it to make themselves rich. That's someone you want to be very far away from. The wrath of Jesus Christ fell on such people in His day. And it will fall on all who abuse the bride of Christ to make financial gain for themselves. It will fall on them. So beware of those. Rome has had her exhibition of relics. 
They believe we have the skull of Mary and all this other nonsense. Thrift store junk. And they paraded it around for profit and said, you know, pay, pay money to Rome, pay money to Rome. And Rome will have hell to pay for her exploiting people in greed in the name of religion. Robbed more poor people than Prince John ever did. Beware of any so-called pastor or teacher who uses the church as their business. The church is not about us, brothers and sisters. It's about the worship and glory of God. It's not about making things convenient for us. Beware of any so-called churches that emphasize finances more than the glory of God. We talk about finances. The Bible talks about money. Pastor Little preached through Proverbs. Lots of Proverbs on money. And we need help with our money. We need help with everything. <laughs> and the Bible talks plenty about money management. That's not wrong. Brother Mitchell had some great thoughts when he went through Ecclesiastes. Things I still think about. On managing your money. We were to be responsible with it. To, to use it to serve the Lord. Not, not just to serve our own material lust and serve our own ends. So beware of churches that emphasize finances more than the glory of God. If the religion is all about money and not about being devoted to God in purity of heart, worshiping Him aright, that's a religion you want nothing to do with. It's an un, uh, ironically, it's an unprofitable religion. And beware of so-called pastors whose entire message is one about how you may be financially blessed as long as you funnel money into their ministry. I mean, they read John MacArthur's book, Strange Fire. Guys in the 20th century were just making millions on, on snake oil and stuff. Just com a complete robbery of folks. And there's going to be a hell to pay for that too. Because God, Jesus, does not take lightly those who abuse His worship and who claim in the name of God, in the name of religion, orthodoxy, abuse people and oppress people and rob people. Jesus had wrath for those people. Drove them out. Beware of any place that claims to be the house of God where all your needs are met. The salesman went to great lengths to meet the needs of the people. But worship was absent. So beware in this day and age when everything's about felt needs. Beware of any place that claims to meet all your needs but God's worship is excluded. That's all you need is to worship God. You want to know what your needs are? Your, need are to, your needs are to worship, love, and obey God. That is all you need. Everything else is not even secondary. It's way down the line, millionth area. Worship God. That's what you need. The house of God is not a means for you or I or anybody to get wealthy. And Jesus will throw out all so-called ministers and anyone in the church who are consumed with greed. He already did it once here physically. And until that day, let us be zealous for the purity of worship that goes on in His house and pray that zeal for His house will eat us up, will consume us. That the worship that we offer in this place or wherever we find ourselves until the Lord takes us on to glory where the worship is pure, that we will seek and strive for purity of worship both within ourselves and within the the collective body, that we will, we will strive for that, that the Lord will give us grace for that, that He will make it so that the worship we offer will be pleasing and acceptable and untainted before Him. Let us pray. Indeed, Lord, we pray that You would spare us from bringing in anything into Your place of worship that would uh, distract us, that would hinder us from worshiping You as we ought. Whatever it is that our hearts uh, lust after, Lord. We pray that you would strip it from us, that you would uh, allow us to only have two eyes full of Jesus Christ and His glory, that you would, Lord, consume us with zeal for the purity of what takes place in this house, that your worship would be, uh, the worship that is offered here would be pleasing to you. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, spare those who are uh, trapped under false ministries who do nothing but seek to exploit people. We pray that you would uh, tear down such places that they no more dishonor your name and that they no more steal and rob from people in the name of religion. We, we pray that you would uh, 
do away with such places. Lord, we have too many in our land. We pray that they would all be wiped out. We, we pray for the establishment of true churches where your word is taught, where the only trading that goes on in those places is the trading of uh, sin and death for the righteousness of Jesus Christ and eternal life with Him. We pray that, O oh Lord, even our day we would see uh, souls come to faith in Christ, that they would know You uh, in, in saving faith and that they would be born again. We pray for an awakening in our time, O oh Lord, that You would come down and cleanse Your house. We know that judgment begins at the house of God. And so we pray, Lord, that You would... Uh, Purge the, the churches in this land, Lord. Remove false doctrine. Remove uh, those who are unregenerate, uh, who, uh, in, who hinder the, the work of the ministry. We pray that you would uh, remove all distractions, uh, things that, that take up time in the church when it ought to be spent on your word and on uh, the ministry of your word. We pray that you would uh, revive us in our times that we might Marvel as your disciples did at your work, we pray in your name. Amen.